Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that's been pretty highly requested by you guys. It is a pretty recent case, so there's not a ton of information, but there is a pretty decent timeline to go off of. I also want to note that a lot of the information that I got for today's case came directly from the Bring Zach Lefebvre Home Facebook page, as well as the Nighttime Podcast, which did an interview with Zach's cousin. Both of those are linked below if you wanna go ahead and check those out, which I do highly suggest you do. I do highly suggest you go and listen to the Nighttime time podcast because he's been putting in so much work for this case, talking to family members and other people involved in the searches to do whatever he can and spread awareness about this case. Also, before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and give a huge shout out to my patrons, Trevor, Alexandria, Lacey, Heather, and David. I truly cannot express enough how much I appreciate each and every one of you for your support and helping me keep this channel going. You guys help me keep doing what I love doing and for that, I want to thank you guys so, so very much. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Zach Lefebvre. Zach Lefebvre was from the area of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia in Canada. He was only two days shy of turning 21 years old when he went missing on New Year's Day in 2021. His mother's name was Lauren and he had a stepdad named Darren and he was the only child that his mother had. His father's name is Michael and he had a few siblings on his dad's side of the family and he was living with his grandma and grandpa at the time, but his mom lived very close by. Him and his family were all very close close and they've played a huge role in the searches and investigation for Zach. Now, Yarmouth is a very small town in Nova Scotia. It has a population of only 6,500 people and it's the type of town where everyone knows everyone. It's an area covered in a lot of densely wooded areas, a lot of streams, lakes, and rivers all run through. Now, Zach was described as being such a kind-hearted guy. He absolutely loved being around kids. He always had such a good connection with children. He was always spending time with his young cousins, nieces, or nephews. He loved them. He was also basically just your typical young adult guy. He loved all sports. He loved playing golf and hockey, but he especially loved baseball, and he excelled at it. When he was in his early teens, around 13 years old, he joined a baseball team over the summer. His coach was so absolutely impressed by his skills at the sport, saying, quote, Later that summer, we hosted Provincinals. Zach had an unbelievable tournament. I had no idea it was possible for a kid that young to hit a baseball that far. It shocked everyone who saw it. It's something I'll never forget. After school, Zach loved hopping on video games with friends. He was also described as being very energetic. He was a wild child when he was younger. He was always wanting to go out and do different activities outdoors. At the time of his disappearance, he was dating a girl named Hannah. The two had been together for a few years at that time, and she said that she just had all of her best moments and fun times with Zach. She said his optimism is what made him so great at everything he tried. His family also described him as a very hard worker. When he lived in Yarmouth, he worked at Dayton Red and White, which is a grocery store. And those who worked with him there too also saw him as a very hard worker who went out of his way to help his coworkers in his free time. Now, the timeline of Zach's disappearance starts in New Year's Eve in 2020, going into 2021. So during the day, him and his friends had just been outside riding around four-wheelers. He got home from that at around 4 p.m. and then left for the night at around 6 p.m. They went to the Grand Hotel to start their night because they knew a couple of friends who had gotten a room there. When he was at the hotel, he drank and partied a little bit with some friends before leaving at around 10 p.m. to get a cab to go to a house party in Plymouth that was around 15 minutes away from where they lived in Yarmouth. I believe this house party was located off of a main road, Highway 334. The area seems like a decently rural small town with a lot of foresty areas and a lot of open lands. Now, at this party, there was a lot of people that Zach didn't know. It seems like one of those parties where Zach's friends knew the people there, so it was more so like the friend of a friend's party. Now, I don't know exactly how long Zach was at the party, but it seemed like he was there for about an hour, hour and a half before he stepped out at around 11.49 p.m. And I do believe there was one witness who saw Zach leave the party that night. Like I said, this was a party where a lot of people didn't really know Zach too well, so no one really paid too much attention when he walked out because again, people didn't really know who he was. 
reasons. He could have been walking out for any number of reasons. He could have been leaving the party, which wouldn't be too much concern to the people there because they didn't really know him. Or he could have just been walking out to go puke or talk on the phone or any number of reasons. So according to the cousin who I listened to on the nighttime podcast, it doesn't seem like the people who Zach actually knew at the party saw him leaving. It was just a random person that remembered seeing him leave. So around 10 to 15 minutes after leaving the party, Zach called one of his friends to let them know that he was walking home. At that point, he told the friend that he thought he was in Quainan on Wilson Road. However, eyewitness accounts would later come out saying that they saw him still in Plymouth, which is around 25 kilometers away from Quinnan. So because of this discrepancy, it's believed that he was incorrect about where he was. So there was really no way that he would have gotten that far just by walking. And of course, it's always possible that he could have gotten a ride over there, but that doesn't even seem likely either. It was also during this first call that Zach told his friend that he wasn't wearing any pants. Now, these friends were still at the party and on the phone, they kept trying to get him to come back so they can get a cab and go home but he kept saying that he can't come back and he can't get into the cab because he had no pants. Now, the temperature has been reported differently depending on the source that you look at, but according to his cousin, it was pretty cold, but it wasn't as bitter cold as it could have been. But according to the cousin, it was around three degrees Celsius at that point, so while it wasn't as cold as it could have been, it definitely was too cold to be walking around without pants on. But no one even knows why he took off his pants to begin with. Either way, other than this, the friend said that he sounded pretty normal on the phone call and he didn't sound distressed. This first phone call ended at 11.52 p.m. So the next phone call he made, I believe, was to a friend who was not at the party that he had just left. This phone call was at 11.54 p.m. and this time he was telling a friend that he was cold and he needed a ride. Again, he still thought that he was in Quainan at this point, but it's thought that he was in Plymouth. But again, in this phone call, he didn't sound distressed. Now, I'm I'm not sure where this conversation really went, why this friend couldn't give him a ride, but obviously he didn't end up giving him a ride. This second phone call ended at 11.58 p.m. Then by 12.02 a.m., just as the new year was ringing in, he made a third phone call to another friend. On this phone call, he told a friend that he was with people of color who were black. I don't know why that's relevant, but it came out that there were no people of color at this party. So whoever he was with at that point were not people who were at the party with him. But the person that he made this phone call with couldn't even confirm whether he was actually with people or not. He didn't hear anybody in the background. He only heard Zach. So it's not known who these other people were or if he was even with anybody. But at the time of this phone call, the friend said that he wasn't too concerned about Zach because he took him for his word. He said that he was with people, so he trusted him. He trusted that he was with people and he was gonna be okay. So because of this, again, they thought that he was safe. They thought that he was with people. So they left the party without him and went home. Around the same time at around midnight, Zach was seen by another eyewitness and her son who said that he was on Newell Road walking towards the edge of the road near a bridge. So this is still in the Plymouth area, which is where he was known to be by the party. By 12.07 a.m., he called another friend that was supposed to go to the party with them that night, but he actually got sick and stayed home. So by the time Zach called, he didn't end up picking up because he was actually sleeping. So to me, it looks like he was trying to call whoever he could to try and find a ride because he had no pants and obviously he was going to be pretty cold walking around. So then by 12.15 a.m., two witnesses driving past saw Zach walking towards Yarmouth on the corner of Newell Road. This was the very last sighting of Zach that night. Then at around 12.45 a.m., that same driver came back in the direction of Plymouth and looked around to see if he could see Zach and Zach was no longer walking on the road. Then sometime between 12.45 and 1 a.m., the other witness who saw him also came back to the Plymouth area and looked around the same area, and he also did not see Zach. After this, he was never seen or heard from ever again. So, that next day on January 1st, when the family woke up and realized that Zach was still not home, they were immediately worried. The concern grew even more into panic when Zach didn't show up for his work shift that was scheduled for noon that day. He had never been one to no-call, no-show, so his boss immediately 
immediately knew that something was off. So right away, the family reported him missing to police. So when police did their initial searches for Zach, they did find his pants on Flint Road, which is right by where he was last seen walking. Inside the pants, they did find his wallet, and I don't think there appeared to be anything missing from the wallet. What they could not find was his cell phone. They tried tracking his cell phone to see if they could find it that way, but after the night that he went missing, it went off and it never got turned back on. So, it was either turned off or it's been dead ever since that night. Other people who wanted to help out with the searches started by going on all of the trails that he was known to like going on. He was just one of those guys who enjoyed being outside and going on walks and going on different trails, so people thought that it was possible that he was on one of those trails. Maybe when he was drunk, he recognized a trail that he liked to go on and started walking on that trail and passed out somewhere. That was sort of the idea that people were going off of at first. But of course, they did not find him any Anywhere. Most of the searches that were done for Zach were civilian searches and they worked so hard to search wherever they could. They did extensive grid searches, they flew over the area in a plane, and they used cadaver dogs. But still, they found nothing. They found absolutely zero sign of him anywhere. No more of his clothes, nothing that belonged to him, absolutely nothing that could have been related to Zach. Now, his cousin said that she did have his phone records and she saw that he had been getting a bunch of missed phone calls from an unknown number with a blocked location. She did say that finding this was a little bit concerning since she had no idea who these phone calls were coming from, but she doesn't even know if police have any further information on these numbers or who they could possibly be or why they were calling him. So we don't really know a lot of information after this. Police and especially the community have come together to continue searching for Zach, but as of right now, there's not much more known about this case. So with that, there are a few main theories that we can consider for what may have happened to Zach. So the first theory and really the main theory that people were going off of going into their initial searches were that he was walking down some sort of road stumbling around because he was pretty drunk. We do know that he seemed a little bit disoriented and confused based off of the phone calls that he was making that night. He kept telling friends that he was at this one location that he was most likely not at because it wasn't even possible that he could have gotten that far that quickly, and he was also seen by a bunch of witnesses who saw him in Plymouth, so that alone kind of discredits where he said that he was. We know that there's a huge river right off of the road and other smaller bodies of of water nearby as well. So for this theory, it's thought that maybe he slipped off into this ginormous river and died and just hasn't been found yet. I will also note that according to his cousin, this river was at high tide around that time, so that makes it almost even more possible that this is what happened. It's also possible that he was drunk, but he was very, very cold, so he went and found somewhere to hide and then huddled there and then died of the elements, but he hasn't been found because he was huddled so small and was hiding behind something. Maybe he, you know, went into a bush or something to keep warm and that's why he hasn't been found yet. But even with that theory, I think it is possible that someone may have missed him while doing grid searches, but I do think that a cadaver dog would have picked up on him if he was in the area. Obviously, cadaver dogs aren't correct 100% of the time. They don't always find what they're looking for, but I do think that they may have found him if he was just huddled up somewhere. I don't know. The other theory going along with this theory is that he was possibly walking down a road, which we know he was, and then he was hit by a driver in a hit and run and was just ejected into the river and the driver just kept going. It was New Year's Eve and we know that unfortunately this night is when a lot of people will make the terrible, terrible decision to go out drunk driving. So maybe there was somebody that was drunk driving and they hit him and they knew that they would get in trouble for hitting him, so they just kept going going. Instead of getting in trouble for reckless manslaughter, they just drove off and hoped that nobody would find him. Or maybe they didn't even realize that they hit a person. Maybe they just assumed it was a deer and that's why they kept going. His cousin said that deer accidents like this is very common in the area, so this being a possible theory is definitely not unheard of. The only real problem with this theory is that there really isn't any evidence to support it. There's no blood anywhere, which you think there would be if someone got hit by a vehicle 
vehicle that hard. There's no tire skid marks to show that someone tried swerving or slowing down. You would think that if somebody knew that they hit something, even if they were planning on driving off, that they would at least try and hit the brakes and then just keep going. So there would be tire marks to show that. I guess if we consider that someone was just that drunk that they hit someone and just kept going and didn't even think to stop, that could be possible why there's no tire marks. So I'm not saying that the fact that there's no tire marks completely points away from this theory, but it does make it a little bit less likely. But that's just my opinion and it's still always completely possible, so I don't want to count it out. So the last theory surrounds the possibility of foul play. Now, like I said, the first theory was that he walked off and succumbed to the elements. But because of how many searches have been done and how much effort has been put in, many people at this point believe that this is what most likely happened. Now, in the nighttime podcast that I listened to, his cousin talked about just how many messages she receives every single day. It's such a small town where everybody knows everybody. People will send her name, say that this person's definitely responsible, this person knows something, and just point the finger at them. She said that there's really two main stories that she's been hearing, but each time she hears these stories, she says that some names are mentioned more than others, while some people will change the names throughout the story. So it's really hard to pinpoint if someone really is responsible, who is actually responsible just based on all of these different stories. Now, one of the main themes in these stories does involve drugs. Now, from what the family knows, Zach is not involved with selling drugs. Not to the point where they just think, oh, he's just such a good kid that he would never do that, that type of thing. No, they literally checked his bank records and searched for things like that that could point to maybe him being involved in that type of thing, but as far as they have seen, there's no evidence to support that he's involved in selling drugs or anything else like that. Because I know that in a lot of other cases, people will say like, oh, sometimes a teenager or a young adult is involved in a lot more things than what their parents know about, but they have conceded that, yeah, he was a young, rowdy guy and he did like to party, so they think it's possible that maybe he did take some sort of drugs at some point, but the evidence shows that he was not involved in selling them. But this town does have a lot of problems with drugs, so that's why they think that it's possible that maybe these overall issues with the town and drugs could be connected to Zach's disappearance. His cousin said that it's likely that he was hanging out with people who were involved with drugs and that they may have been the ones to get him into trouble. Again, it is always possible that he was involved in drugs more than what his family knew, so they're always taking that into consideration. They're definitely not ruling that out as a possibility. That's really all the family has said about that, so I'm not going to go on to speculate anymore, but there definitely is a big possibility of foul play. The other possibility that I've seen thrown around is that with just how much Plymouth has been searched, it is possible that maybe someone picked him up and drew drove him out of the area. Because again, you would think that with just how much searching has been done, that they would have found at least something. Maybe he was walking on the side of the road and after his phone died from calling all of these different friends trying to get a ride, maybe he started hitchhiking and maybe the wrong person picked him up. That's always possible. We do know, again, that it was New Year's Eve and that people were out driving and people were out going home and going to different parties. So if I really want to stretch here, maybe someone picked him up on the side of the road, brought him to a party out of the area, and something happened there. I don't know, that's just pure speculation at this point. My mind is just going a million miles an hour about all of the possibilities that could have happened because it just feels like there's one big piece of the puzzle that is just missing. And once we figure out what that piece is, all of this will make so much more sense. But either way, that is all the information that I have in today's case. I know that this has been a little bit of a shorter case, but I do think that it definitely has the potential to be solved. It's only been a little bit under eight months, which yes, is a very long time for somebody to be missing, but it's not completely unheard of for a case to be solved at this point. There is still so much more that we just don't know about this case, and the family is heavily relying on help from the public. They have ask that if you do live in this area to go ahead and check your home surveillance to see if you see anything on it. The family has also said that they are so appreciative of all of the community help that they've received along the way. So many people have come out to show their support and help with the searches, so they are confident that they will find him sooner or later. The family is so desperate for answers and all they want is for Zach to come home. Zach Lefebvre was seen on January 1st, 2021 on Highway 3 
334 in Plymouth, Nova Scotia, in Canada. He was wearing a plaid shirt and boxers at the time. He's described as a white male standing at 5 feet 9 inches tall, 175 pounds, with brown hair and facial hair and blue eyes. Anybody with information is asked to call the Yarmouth Royal Canadian Mounted Police at 902-742-9106 or the Nova Scotia Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. There's currently a $30,000 reward for information leading to finding Zach. So, that is all I have for today's video. I know that this is a Canadian case, but cases that happen outside of the U.S. are just as important to be aware of in the U.S. So all I ask is that if you are from Canada or from the U.S. or anywhere else, please just share his picture. Share his family's Facebook page or the nighttime podcast or this video. Like I said, there definitely is potential for this case to be solved. We just need a little bit more information that can just tip this over the edge and finally get this case to where it needs to be. No matter what information you may know, no matter how big or small it may seem to you, it could be exactly what this case was missing to finally solve this case. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to know what your guys' thoughts are. What do you think happened to Zach? Do you think he's still out there after succumbing to the elements or do you think foul play is involved? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Don't forget to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn on the notification bell to be notified of any future video of mine. Make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.